All right, uh, good afternoon and welcome. This is our first set of notes. So part one uh, from chapter eight, graphical representation of VLE of mixtures. Uh, and so in the first half of the book, chapters one through seven, we focus on pure component phase behavior. So in chapter two, we talked about uh, PVT phase behavior of pure component systems. Uh, and in chapter two, we looked at uh, graphical representation of VLE, right? Motivation being, uh, when we got all the way to chapter 7 and we were using cubic equations of state to predict VLE, we had an idea of what that end uh, phase behavior that we're trying to predict should look like. Okay, So in chapter 8, we begin to talk about mixtures. First chapter, um, you know, chapter 8, our main focus is going to be a graphical representation of uh, VLE, of binary mixtures, so that as we move to other topics involving mixtures, we have in our head a picture of what uh, that expected phase behavior uh, should look like. Okay. And so uh, we'll start out with a relatively short set of notes, uh, just kind of you know, setting up the problem. Okay. Where if I have a binary system in uh, binary system in uh, you know, vapor liquid coexistence, or it could be liquid liquid equilibrium. So if I have a binary system uh, with two phases in coexistence, so say a vapor and liquid. All right, here I have a cartoon of a vapor in equilibrium with the liquid. A superscript V is going to correspond to the temperature and pressure of the two phases. Uh, Ys are going to be used to indicate mole fractions of my vapor phase. It's a binary mixture, so one component will be A, the other B. Then I'll have a liquid where the mole fractions in the liquid I'll designate with uh, X. Okay. So if I have these two phases in vapor liquid coexistence, the first question is, uh, what do we know? Well, we have a mixtures, uh, mixture in, in mole fraction is something that we haven't, you know, needed when we talked about pure components. Okay, but I define my mole fraction as being you know, the moles of that species relative to the total moles, uh, in this case, in that phase. All right, so YA would be the moles of A in the vapor relative to the total number of moles. Okay, and so our mole fractions um, have to sum to one. Right, so we know our mole fractions compositions have to sum to one. Okay. and know that mole fraction is an intensive property. Okay. So if I have a homogeneous system um, for this binary mixture and I cut it in half, right, the mole fraction composition of those two halves of that original system are going to be exactly the same. And I mentioned this for when we get to talk about Gibbs phase rule later on, uh, composition or mole fraction uh, can be used and will be used as an intensive property to fix the state of my system. Okay. In terms of vapor liquid coexistence, okay, if I have my two phases in coexistence, we also know we have three criteria of phase coexistence. Right? The first is um, I have mechanical equilibrium. Mechanical equilibrium means that the pressure of those two phases are the same. Okay? Um, so there's no net exchange of PV boundary work between the two phases. I have thermal equilibrium. Uh, so the temperature of my two phases are equal. Um, there's no net rate of heat exchange between the two phases. And then my third criteria was chemical equilibrium. Okay. So we started out uh, back in the first half of the book, and we said for a pure component system, that means that the molar Gibbs free energy of the two phases are the same. Okay. Now when we have mixtures, we need to differentiate that a little bit. Okay. So if we were dealing with you know, molar Gibbs free energy, it would actually be the partial molar Gibbs free energy of each species in each phase has to be the same. Or equivalently, we could use chemical potential, um, or um, we can use our auxiliary function we introduced in chapter seven, uh, fugacity, uh, which hopefully you you know grow some appreciation to, to know and love uh, in the second half of the book. And we could say that the fugacity of each species in each phase uh, is equal. Right. And so typically, you say that we have an isofugacity relation for each species. Right? So the fugacity of component A in the vapor is equal to the fugacity of component A in the liquid. And then same is true for my second species, B. Okay, so think about the Gibbs phase rule. Okay. So the number of intensive independent, uh, so number of intensive um, independent uh, properties that need to be specified to fix unambiguously the thermodynamic state of my system is F is n minus pi plus 2. So n is the number of components, pi is the number of phases, and then 2 is 2. So if I have a binary system, okay, n is 2, uh, vapor liquid coexistence, I have two phases, so n minus pi is 0, plus 2. So if I have a binary system at vapor liquid coexistence, 
I need to specify two intensive thermodynamic properties to fix the state of my system. Okay, so it could be temperature and composition, could be pressure and composition, could be temperature and pressure. Okay, but if I say this binary mixture is at vapor liquid equilibrium at this temperature and pressure, that's enough to fix the state of my system. Okay. What about a binary mixture not at VLE? Well, if I have a binary mixture not at VLE, uh, well then n is still 2, but now pi is 1. So I have 2 minus 1, uh, 1 plus 2, 3. So for a binary system in a single phase, I need three intensive properties to fix the state of my system. Okay, great. So now if you think about mass transfer, if you've started to talk about equilibrium stage separations in your mass transfer class, you know, or even just thinking about um, back to chapter two when we were talking about PBT phase behavior of, of your fluids, um, realistically, we like to look at our graphs uh, in two dimensions. So if I wanted to plot the properties of a binary system, it could be one phase, it could be more. Um, if I want to plot uh, the phase behavior of that system, okay, you know, here I have three intensive independent variables. You know, I can't plot that in two dimensions. I could plot it in three dimensions, where I have, say, temperature versus pressure versus composition, um, but then that becomes a little, uh, you know, intractable or not real, very realistic in terms of, you know, um, problems that we actually want to solve. And so what we'll talk about next will be uh, TXY and PXY phase diagrams. And what we typically do to plot uh, the phase behavior of our systems in just two dimensions is we take one of our uh, properties, temperature, pressure, composition. So we'll look at the case of temperature and pressure and we fix it. Okay, so in a TXY phase diagram, we'll fix the pressure. So we'll say the pressure is equal to one bar and then we'll plot temperature versus composition. In a PXY, we'll fix temperature. Temperature will be taken to be constant and we'll plot pressure versus composition. And if you think in terms of actual realistic applications, you know, think about analyzing a distillation column in your separations class. Right? Typically, you can assume, say, your distillation column operates at a constant pressure. Maybe it's one bar, right, or it's essentially one atmosphere. So in that case, then, you know, the TXY phase diagram would be the diagram of interest in terms of designing a distillation column, right? My pressure is going to be constant, but I know I'll have some temperature gradient throughout that column and going from my reboiler to my condenser. Okay, so again, if we wish to plot you know, our properties in two dimensions, uh, we have to fix um, one of our values, and that's what we'll do next when we start to look at phase diagrams.